just give you the highlights. No chance, no chance. <laughs> we don't, we don't do highlights. <laughs> we do. <laughs> so I think what Gathi basically what we, I mean, of course. Just, just the basic idea as to what where you are today, and then that journey that we have to take up till here, we'll go through that journey. So just an idea of. Okay, so where I am today is um, I I just graduated from the Ontario College of Art and Design with a master's degree in strategic foresight and innovation, and uh, my uh, major research paper was called uh, "Splitting Rock at Laughing Falls: Drawing uh, 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 the Arts uh, and Consciousness into Social Justice Mediation." So I have been a mediator for. Um, a while, maybe 20 years, I think. <laughs> Sometimes you lose track of time. Um, and, um, and I live in a small town in uh, an area of, of uh, Western Canada in the province of British Columbia uh, called Falkland. Uh, population maybe 300 on a nice oh. day. Um, <laughs> that's, like, that's like a few houses around my place <laughs> well and, and this is a populated area for me because up until five years ago I lived uh, in the forest on a 20 acre uh, property uh, about an hour's drive from here where I designed and built a house wow. um, I neither designed nor built this house but I did augment it with some things like fences and decks and things like that. So I build things. But how do you how did you compromise so much to be living in this place and leaving that place? Like, well, I fell in love and um, uh, the compromise started from there. I'm, these things are important. And so her children go to school in this mm -hmm. little town, although the youngest one is graduating from elementary school next year. Okay. So we I'm already into the process of designing the next house. So, wow. <laughs> but at some stage, we'll see the photographs of all those, the, the last house and everything. <laughs> yes. So now we'll have to go back. Now we have to go all the way back as much at the back that you want to take us through your grandparents, great grandparents, wherever you want to start. Sure. I mean, I don't have pictures that go back. Can I share my screen? One second. Just give me one second. One second. Yeah. Okay, share screen. Let's see. Where did it get to? Yeah, the only thing I, yeah. Can you see that? Yep. Okay, so um, in Canada, we have a fairly recent tradition to acknowledge the Indigenous lands uh, that we live on. And uh, so I live on the lands of the Shewepam people. And uh, one of the things that I did as part of my university was um, I got to go to an art uh, school where I got to play in the wood shop. And so I had before that been making cutting boards out of birch that I'd cut down on my property, but I then got to laser print poems that I wrote uh, onto those, onto some of those cutting boards. So I have a couple of examples. And so this is a land acknowledgement that I wrote. And uh, one of them that I wrote, the governor general of the province of Ontario decided to use at an opening of a big conference. So that was kind of a fun highlight, okay, but, uh, but I'll read it. It says, heart's feet, land beneath, she weapon not forgotten, Shh. reveals long love, settled among pine, ever vigilant silk, uh, salmon, water calls, uninvited guest, I acknowledge place connects, visiting briefly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and let's see. And so um, this is the little baby in the picture is my father. Uh, he was born in South End and Sea in England. That's my grandmother and my uncle, um, Eric. Mm -hmm. So my, my uh, dad came to New York City when he was a year old. And, um, um, and my mom, I don't have a picture of my mom. My mom, uh, well, yes, I do have a picture of my mom. Here's... Um, my mother front and center as she often was. <laughs> and uh, that's me in the top row third from the left beside my 
paternal grand uh, paternal grandmother we were um about to set sail my grandparents were about to set sail on a trip around the world um and then uh, a few years later uh, i left for europe with my family on the same boat uh, on the oriana we sailed through the panama canal um uh, to uh to um bermuda jamaica um, landed in in uh, in England, and uh, I think I was ten at the time, and we uh, spent a year uh, in Frankfurt, Germany. My father was a professor of chemistry. But isn't that, so that we, is, we lived that there? A, that's a lot that happened. We have to go back to that photograph. There's so much in between that's happened. What about all that? <laughs> we have to cover that. <laughs> you can't I do this. In an hour here, Vikram. <laughs> We can take more episodes, not an issue. We can uh, always take it again. We're not going to rush this at all because the whole interest, the, everything is in between that. Maybe Kathy uh, today, Kathy today is in between all that. And to be able to <laughs> skip that, I'm not going to let that happen. It's a mere 70 years. So, you know, not mere, a lot. Mere. Mere. Okay. So I think maybe we'll have what, 70 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but anyway, well, the reason I'm telling, sort of leaping ahead to tell the story, because I'm I'm painting a bit of a picture of how I became a mediator, no, and no, um, no. and so I think that that early experience of of living in in Germany uh, at age ten, going to a German elementary school, it was an international school, but I went to school in in German just with no German before that. Um, saying, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying that, that these are things that you think are the reasons or whatever the whatever you feel has been the cause of you being a mediator. I'm saying there are certain things we might miss, which you also might have missed. And all those might have been important. And that is the whole idea of going through it slowly because the okay. whole idea behind this I'll show let, is that. I'll let you lead. You ask the questions, I'll answer them. <laughs> so that's why we have to go back to the earlier photograph and start from there now. Okay, so, 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 so this is now your uncle and your my yeah. father and my grandmother. Yeah, so um, this is uh, this is where where in England is this? Oh. Uh, I don't I don't think this is in England. Oh, yeah, this would have been in England. It would have been in South End on Sea. Um, okay. So in nineteen twenty seven, probably. Okay. So this is. So now you I mean, but you, this, this is the period your father remembered. He spoke about his time there in England. And... Um, no, because he was a baby. He, they moved to uh, to New York City when he was only one, okay. and so he remembers living in New York City. He doesn't know how they came to live there. They lived in a very um, fancy apartment. Uh, my grandfather was a jeweler. Um, my grandmother had been, in fact, one of those Rosie the Riveters during the First World War, um, but they came they came to to uh, the United States to start a new life. Um, my grandfather was attacked on the street when he first arrived and was in the hospital for a year with amnesia. And then he woke up and he said, "Where's my wife?" And so he sent for them and. Um, my uh, grandmother borrowed some money from her brother, and uh, three of them got on a boat and came to New York. But what, what, what was that? I mean, fight, whatever, when he got hit, what was that? No, he wasn't in a fight. He was just attacked, and his wallet was stolen. So he okay. didn't have any ID. So nobody knew who he was. So mugging was part of New York all that while back. Oh, yes. <laughs> wow. What, what what do you think was the reason for that? I mean, why was New York like that? Oh, I, I have I have no idea. It was a busy, growing uh, town. I um, uh, forget the name of the fellow who basically decided that uh, the island and the port, uh, that terrain needed to be absolutely flattened. So they leveled it and put in a grid, um, as was the colonial practice at the time not something that you're happy with no not not at all <laughs> <laughs> one goes totally against your concept of design and design of uh, cities uh, yes because it's designed uh for greedy people to make money and mm -hmm. to control people rather than to 
uh, work with the land and see what is revealed by the land and by the people who live there. And basically, that then that model continues. Every city then develops like that, and then the whole you have all those kind of cities everywhere. That's, that's we, we do. <laughs> yeah, okay, so we'll get to that. Maybe that's a much later, maybe later episodes. Maybe we'll get into so that. Ninety-two. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so but well, like I tell you what, I normally try to keep the tab on years also, so that at least we know where we are. So right now, I mean, your father comes in at about nineteen twenty-nine or something. He comes into the US. Twenty-seven, he was born. Yeah. So so nineteen by about nineteen twenty-eight, twenty-nine is here. Yeah. Okay. So perfect. So now then, I mean, what 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 is the kind of upbringing he has, the circumstances that he grows up in? Oh well, um, he lived in an apartment at Twelfth and C, and so he, when it was hot like it is here, he would go up onto the top of their apartment building and look up at the Empire State Building. He went to um, a private uh, school, still very well known school called Townsend Harris. Um, he graduated from university from high school, that is, at, at age fifteen, and went to university. But he was socially totally unprepared for that. Um, and so he, he uh, left the university and joined the army, light about his age, um, joined the army at 17. Mm -hmm. He uh, wanted to be a pilot. Um, so he, he had rather poor eyesight. He used to tell a story of going into a big department store in New York City and looking out and um, for the first time uh, seeing people out, out there. Um, because his eyesight was pretty poor, but he wanted to be a pilot. So he exercised his eyes and, and uh, improved his vision. But by the end of the medical testing that you go through in the army, he was virtually blind again. So when they showed him the chart and said, you know, tell, read the letters, he said, what chart? Mm -hmm. um, so he ended up being in the army um, and he was the only um, person in his, in his, whatever you call it, unit that did not go to fight in the Battle of the Bulge. So he was the only one who survived. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, so, so stories about conflict, I guess, were an early part of my history, uh, childhood family stories uh, being told. So but what are the kind of stories it told you? I mean, what all did you well, hear just, about? Just, just that one, uh, you know, about the Battle of the Bulge. On my mother's side of the family, my great grandfather was a consummate storyteller. And uh, this is where I began to learn about Native Americans. He had lots of interactions. He was the, my great grandfather was the governor of the territory of Arizona before it became a state, um, was a homesteader out there and had many uh, interactions with, um, with, uh, people who lived there before that the American government as the Canadian government were busily trying to exterminate. But he had, he had good relationships with those, with those people. Uh, one of the stories there was the chief came uh, to, to chat with him one day and he had two Pinto ponies with him. And uh, the chief said, I'd like to trade these two ponies for your wife. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and, um, and he said, um, well, she's, you know, she's not very tidy or very clean and, you know, would really be pretty bad deal. So, um, the chief said, well, maybe he'd keep his ponies. <laughs> um, excuse, excuse me just a second. Yeah. yeah. Would you like me to go into the bedroom? Is it possible that because you're on that big computer, yeah, I can I can do that. Hang on, hang on. Um, I need to move this computer to a, another room. So yeah, please, please. I'm just gonna unplug and I'll I'll be back in a, in a few minutes. Okay. Yep. Sure. Sure, I can. Sure. I'm I'm just gonna un unplug. So uh, I think I have to turn everything off. Should I stop? I'll stop the share. I'll stop the share right now. I'll just leave the meeting yeah. and I'll come back. Yeah, in yeah. A few minutes, yeah. Okay. Not a problem. Not a problem. So, Lisa, okay, Rosalia is here. But tell me, Lisa, do you remember Ken also was speaking about his mother doing that, what, Rosie the Rivetta thing? Yes, yes, she also did. Um, actually, uh, yeah, my mother didn't. 
Um, but my father was did not go to the war. So because he had um, as a child, he had um, <laughs> like you. Fever, and that meant that he had a, a heart thing. So he was exempted from you the got service. So- you were so used to be on doing on the show that suddenly now you're back into your life history. No, it's about oh, the times, though. It's about the okay, times. Okay. In those yeah. times, everyone went, all the men went to war, and the women stayed, the women who were home went and started working in the factories. And this was actually the first movement of women starting to become empowered because before that women didn't work that much so this whole movement then of uh, women working in the factories started the movement of of the realization for women that they they could be more involved in earning money so i mean it's a really important time and it yeah. doesn't get yeah. enough yeah credit. we should we should say in hi to rosalia at this point of time rosalia just come in hello how are you Oh, oh, good, good. Just been very busy. How is everyone? Everyone is good. Kato, how are you? Kato hasn't told us how he is. Right. I'm okay. Right. I'm busy with preparing for my exam in coming September. That That's for the clinical psychologist one. And it's fun to sit for the exam at my age, I have to say. <laughs> But, but Rosalia, what have you been busy with? Oh, uh, besides work, uh, research, I'm working on research that I have to submit by the end of the month. Uh, I, so I, I have to submit like 200 pages, and um, I've been working a lot on that. Plus, uh, my parents, my father fell, you know, so I was in the mm-hmm. hospital with him, you know, accompanying him uh, at the emergency, and then uh, taking care of them uh, at my parents' place. So that's why you haven't seen me much. But is he okay now? He... He's fine. He's he's got bruises everywhere. It's, it's incredible. He just fell from his chair. He he fell asleep on his chair. He fell on the floor, and he, you know, he's ninety nine and a half. He's 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 six nine. So he's got bruises everywhere. You know, his at that mm-hmm. age, your your skin is very thin. Yeah, it's it's like parchment paper. So he's got lacerations like this. Like it's incredible. He's the same age as my mom. She's ninety nine yes. and a half too. Yeah, so it's it's a uh, if it's not my dad, it's my mom. So I'm always rushing um, over, you know. Like uh, it, it's been, um, I mean, I I'm I'm grateful that they're alive, but it's a uh, it's it's you know it's, it's a lot. Uh, and I have a brother that lives with them, but he, he can't handle. Uh, it's too much for him now. He's overwhelmed, you know. It's too it's twenty four hour care. So we're trying to organize. Um, 24-hour care with nurses, you know. Like, uh, so that that's been basically um, my uh, focus. Uh, besides work, the re- the research I'm working on is uh, is very very uh, time-consuming. But tell us about it. Do you want to tell us about it? It's basically on international mediation. You know, when we last time I I, um, I participated in uh, one of your uh, I can't remember who the speaker was, but any uh, last time I, I remember when uh, I think you had someone from um, a professor. I can't remember his name and uh, from India, and he was asking about international law, um, international mediation, <laughs> and I, I kind of directed him towards a lot of uh, a lot of the the policies that the UN has. Um, I'm using a lot of those documents, the UN Charter. There's so much, like UN resolutions, and and also I'm um actually next week I'm a delegate at UNCTAD trial because Very I'm nice. uh yeah it's not what the first time. No, what you know. do, Rosalie, What we do is because Kathy says she only has an hour, so uh, when, when she, if she, if she only sticks for an hour, we would want her to stay longer. I hope she does. But supposing she does, then after that we'll have a discussion on this. Uh, I won't be able to because I, I have to rush to my parents also. But uh, I, I really, I was listening to her uh, live on your, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, YouTube. YouTube. Uh, the YouTube. And it's fantastic. Great. Uh, very articulate. Uh, I just wanted to say hi to her. <laughs> but but then, uh, Kathy, what is the politically correct thing to say about the indigenous people? Is it indigenous people or native? What about, how do you use? Indigenous people is the 
term that was agreed to at the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Okay, um, right. In Canada, the term, the official Canadian government term is Aboriginal people as a way of including um, First Nations, uh, Métis and uh, Inuit. Um, and so there's your update. No, because actually why I'm asking you because, uh, okay, Rosalia is here. Rosalia works with the Canadian government. Ah, she's, in, she's, in, she's in Montreal. I also oh. work uh, with, uh, I also work with indigenous um, uh, partnerships and agreements and uh, exactly, it's exactly, uh, there's the declaration, you, you gave them the declaration that, you know, that uh, about the indigenous land, like how we recognize indigenous land and uh, before every meeting. <laughs> Actually, why I was asking this was because from August, I'm starting, uh, there's a, a symposium that I'm uh, organizing. The topic is mediation in our culture and traditions. Mm -hmm. So the traditions of the indigenous people all over the world, we need to discuss that. So I would definitely need you people to come up, come, I mean, whatever you have seen there, let's talk about it so you can be you, you i mean would be speaking on that that's what i'm trying to put across to you that you have to give me time for that sure i think i think that there are some um indigenous scholars in canada who could speak and of course mediators but i'm thinking of leanne betasamoke simpson as one of the uh, scholars who in her book as we have always done wrote about mediation and I write about this in my master's uh, paper, wrote about mediation um, between uh, the Hoof clan and the Anishinaabe because the Anishinaabe had not been looking after the land well and the Hoof people went away and there went their food source. And so they had to bring in mediators and others to negotiate a different kind of agreement with the Hoof clan. So these are the guys, you'll have to message me the name, the person which you said, professor. And any other people that you can think of, please send me those names. Let's start getting in touch with them. And this is something which will carry on. It's not going to be, it doesn't have to be only August. It can carry on into September also, depending on the number of speakers that I get. So I really feel we'll, we'll, we'll have some very interesting discussions. The, the way I'm looking at it from various parts of the world. Yeah, Rosalia. You um, I just wanted to add, you might want to um, have... There's, you know, the, the whole issue with the residential schools. I, I had worked on uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for a while, um, and there are survivors or uh, children of survivors, and some of them are actually uh, their speakers. Uh, they might, that might be also, it, it, it's a difficult conversation, uh, but that might be an interesting uh, twist that you might want to add. I don't know. So please tell me who those people are and you, if you can, can you want to connect with them or whatever. So basically, Kathy, Rosalia, Lisa, Lisa also will have no names. So please send them to me. Kato, anyone that you can think of. We need people from all over the world, every corner of the world. And we, it'll be very interesting. What I'm trying to say is that, look, the mediation of the world is something that we are familiar with. But the process is something that every part of the world people are familiar with. So let's just, and luckily now with the Singapore Convention defining mediation in such a broad manner, at least we can put across that that is what we're talking about. Any process, given a very a broad definition there. So I think that is what we, I, I feel we were quite interesting. Yeah, and I think, I think the other aspect of that, of course, is that mediation in the way it's currently practiced, you know, it, in the United States, Certainly, it was in the in the twenties that the legal justice system was feeling overrun and began to introduce what they called alternative dispute methods methods into the legal system. And from my perspective, as a non legal mediator, <laughs> I feel that the mediation profession has been moved away from its original exactly. intent. Yeah, exactly. Um, that is what we have to basically, basically focus on that. <laughs> No, but this is what we're going to focus on. This is exactly yeah. what we need to focus on because the, the way we've maybe the world, it should not be introduced because I tell you, US might be a mature market in terms of mediation, but there's so much more to happen in the world. So why not take something which is part of our culture into the world rather than take this aspect which has developed in one part of the world? Maybe it doesn't, it's not, won't work maybe other places. I don't know. Maybe so, so I think it should be something which would be a good thing as we go along. Oh, I, I agree, Vikram, and I, I know that in, in the recent Congress that uh, Mediators Beyond Borders uh, International held, I can't remember when it was, last June, um, 
uh, anyway, brought in, brought in mediators from around the world who brought forward their cultural uh, practices and, and integrated those with the kind of work that Lisa and I do, which is drawing in the creative arts uh, to the mediation process. So. Okay. So, so we'll take that. Okay, now right now we're going back to, where are we going now? Because you said Rosie the Riveter. <laughs> and Ken Cloak also spoke about that because his mother was also doing that. So that was, I'm just saying. Oh, they probably knew each other. <laughs> no, <laughs> no I think, okay, the whole idea about the series is that we're going to make connections between mediators, what is common, what is, so this is one common thing that has come up. <laughs> of course, of course. <clears throat> so well, now yeah. Sure, I'll go back to share my screen. Um, share, there we go. Um, can you see that? Yep. It's going to move people into the middle so that I'm looking at people and not at the screen. So that's my grandmother, great uh, grandmother, Rosie the Riveter, and my father in the middle as a baby. Um, this, this is was, my. This, too much, yeah, this is too much later. I mean, we need to. There's a whole period in between that we have to cover. We'll get here. We'll get here at some stage, Kathy. We don't know how long it'll take, but we'll get here. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay. but you, was, I don't have any other pictures in between. I don't have pictures of my mother's family, as I indicated. My my mother was born in Arizona. Um, my parents met at the University of Berkeley in California. Uh, I was born in California. Oh, no, God, that's too fast. That's too fast. But <laughs> how? I mean, I what, was born. That we were talking about me. <laughs> Wait a minute. You getting there? The, all the circumstances that brought you there is brought you out is what we have to. We have to also. Okay, but otherwise, what what were they studying? What were your parents uh, studying? My mother was uh, had was there on a scholarship. She'd done work at the United Nations, uh, but she studied social work. Um, but she only practiced for one day because she didn't like it. So uh, my father was a chemist. Um, he, he wanted to be an engineer, but when he came out of the army, the lineup for engineering was too long and the lineup for chemistry was really short. So he became a chemist. <laughs> That's a practical way to choose your subject. <laughs> oh, okay, so now, you, now you're born. You, we, let's get there now. You, this is, you want to be born so fast, so let's, get, <laughs> let's have you out there. <laughs> yes. I was born. Isn't didn't Charles Dickens write that? Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> that so. I, don't, I would not know because I'm an illiterate person, so I have no idea. <laughs> um, okay, so where would you like to go from here, Vikram? I mean, when you, this is where are you now? I mean, where are you born? Uh, in in Oakland, California. Okay. So, because what you have to just take, I mean, take us back into what are those first memories that you have, which you. I mean, so one of the stories that you've been told about your growing up, but what are those images that you have in your mind right now? What would you think? Um, it was uh, it was um, a time of hanging out um, with my cousins, and uh, I, one uh, my maternal grandparents lived in uh, San Jose, California. My father at the, my grandfather at the time was a plumbing contractor, and. Uh, <clears throat> And so I used to go to work with him sometimes and count the little, little copper pieces, um, mm -hmm. get into trouble. Mm -hmm. um, my paternal grandparents that you see in this picture, that's my grandmother uh, wearing the corsage there behind my mother, mm -hmm. me to her right, and my sister to her left. Um, uh, they lived uh, on a just on a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean in a little town called Solana Beach. And so uh, I grew up swimming in the ocean there, um, loved to be in the water, uh, was in the water as often as I could get. Uh, my dad was a very strong swimmer, so I learned how to body surf and all those good things. And then when I was five, my father won a postdoctoral fellowship and we moved to Rochester, New York. Um, where we went from warm tropical conditions all year round to um, a brutal winters. And <laughs> I remember going to nursery school there and learning to pledge allegiance to the flag. Um, it seemed like an odd activity to begin the day with uh, for me. Um, I was busy uh, getting into trouble trying to understand how my bicycle worked 
and I got my baby finger caught in the bicycle chain and my mother had to call the fire department to come and um, rescue me. So I have a long you know, history of, of my mother um, having found me in um, interesting circumstances. So the police came, the fire department came with all sorts of hoo-ha and got my little finger out of the bike and um, I continued to cycle off into other adventures. Uh, okay. And after a year in Rochester, we moved to Vancouver, British Columbia. My father took an appointment at the university there. And for the few, first few years, we lived in, in um, army barracks uh, that had become student housing. And that was, that was great fun. It was uh, basically in the middle of a rainforest with big, huge trees and ponds to fall in and uh, things to climb. I climbed to the top of a 70 foot fir tree and when my mother called me for lunch, I realized that I didn't know how to get down. Um, so slowly and patiently, she put, showed me where to put one foot and the other foot and guided me back down to the ground. But I continued to climb up things. Um, but how old were you at that time? Five. 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 Wow. Well, yeah. that's there was young. a lovely water tower that I liked to climb up to. You had a great view of the surrounding area. Wow. But that, but that period, I mean, the, the, this photograph is, I want to, how old are you in this photograph? Uh, in this photograph? <laughs> um, I'm probably about f five, I think. Oh, okay. um, okay. So, uh, so yeah. about this phase, about this phase in life that this, all this is happening, all the interesting yeah. things that you're up to. Yep. Yep. Good. Um, started to school. No, but I'm sure, I'm sure that, I mean, in terms of, I mean, these are, of course, certain snatches that you've right now just thought about if you look back so much more that you can maybe get into a little deeper and think some i'm sure there's some interesting things around you in terms of the people around you their relationships and all that happening around you because according to me all that also then whatever in terms of being a mediator or whatever you do all that also has an influence. So, I mean, do you have any idea of the, the, the environment that you were living in and the circumstances around you in terms of society, country, world, anything that you have any idea? Anything that... I don't know. My, my main um, focus in life at this period was to be playing outside, um, to be uh, exploring nature, climbing trees. I found some bushes that had little berries on them and I brought them home and made a pie. Um, turned out they were huckleberries, but I, I didn't know that at the time. So I was, I was very curious. I guess I still am. Um, and my father as a chemist was also curious and encouraged that uh, curiosity. And sometimes it got me into difficult situations. Um, but for the most part, I, I had a very privileged life. Um, we, we lived uh, on the university campus for a couple of years and then we moved um, to a house uh, that was close to the beach. And so my adventures moved from the forest to the beach and um, uh, we'd spend hours at the beach, my, the local kids in the neighborhood um, building forts and rafts to see if we could sail out to sea. And then uh, when I was 12, my dad and I built a small sailboat uh, and um, it was an eight-foot sailboat, and I haul that to the beach and sail off into the sunset. Sometimes that's interesting. That's, that's fun life. That's it a fun was a, life. That was a very, it was a very carefree and and fun life. I I really knew nothing of of the world other than this these beautiful places that I had lived. Um, so by the time I was five, I'd lived in three or four different cities and um, but what, and what year dead, yeah. but what year is that what year, what what year? well i was born in 1951 okay so we're so talking about 1956 okay. 56 mm -hmm. or so mm -hmm. okay. i'm just thinking what was this what about what was happening in the world at that time i'm just thinking that <laughs> no, not that i know i mean i thought that i know but i'm just thinking <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's an interesting question. And, and, and that question became more apparent to me when we went to live in, in, in Germany for a year in Frankfurt. Um, and, uh, and there I was suddenly exposed to the world in all its raw conflict. Uh, we, went, um, we went to Berlin. My father went to Berlin. The wall was just going up. It was 1962. 
62. Um, we camped right beside the, the Berlin Wall. Um, I um, was asking my parents, you know, what's, what's going on here? There were people at the wall, Germans at the wall, speaking to the Russian soldiers, giving them cigarettes on the other side of the wall, begging to get information about their family members who were now on the other side of the wall. We went through Checkpoint Charlie um, and my dad was taking, going to meet a chemistry colleague. And I know that he was taking an Agatha Christie novel and a Hershey's chocolate bar as gifts to this colleague. And my job was to sit in the back seat of our little Volkswagen bug on the secret compartment where these treasures were stored. And I can remember, even though I was only uh, 10 at the time, uh, walking through Checkpoint Charlie and, um, and, and my father being interrogated uh, and then allowed to go. And we went from this sort of, the, the stark image is one of going from a color photograph to a black and white photograph. Um, the, the East Berlin was pretty much devoid of color, probably was enhanced by the fact that I think it was rainy. Um, and then uh, later on, on that same year, so, so this year was really pivotal for me in terms of eventually becoming a mediator because we uh, later went to, to Budapest, uh, into, into Hungary, and um, uh, where we wandered around the city and the bullet holes were still very apparent in the walls at night. Um, the only thing to be seen was a, the red star on top of the Fisher's Bastion. And uh, the interesting thing was our neighbors in, in, in Vancouver uh, had um, a woman who came to live with them to help look after their children. And she had been shot um, uh, making an escape from Hungary her husband and son were killed and she wore a bandage around her arm where a bullet had been embedded. And so we knew, we knew that Charlotte had come from this, but then to go and see it, you know, face to face with the, with the bullets in the wall and, and that uh, very bleak environment, um, you know, clearly had an impact on me when we were driving from Budapest to Yugoslavia um, uh, we got a bit lost and suddenly um, we found ourselves at gunpoint and um, uh, we were escorted out of the country with a Russian general uh, with five stars on his epaulette with his gun pointed at my father's head uh, riding on the running board of the Volkswagen escorting us out of the country. So I wasn't directly involved in, in those conflicts myself. They didn't involve me or my my, my people directly, but I was exposed to those um, uh, situations um, without really understanding uh, why. Why were these people, why was a wall being built in the middle of a, a beautiful city to keep people apart? Why, why were we not permitted to drive our car down the road as we had done, you know, driving across North America? So these were, you know, questions that eventually yeah. I think inform my career. And for you, I mean, a major contrast. I mean, here you're that fun-loving, carefree person go and sees suddenly this. There is a world like this. That's very really shocking, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, maybe at that point of time, it's not. I mean, it's not something that you even think about. It's what you were put into. But the numbing aspect of it, I'm sure there must be something that affects you. But, but Kathy, what you, one thing what you have to do is because obviously there are a lot of illiterate people like me who do not know the historical background of that situation that you said about the wall being brought up and the Hungary situation. A little bit of the historical background of that period, if you could tell us. Well, you know, I think it's it's the it's the it's complicated history that that continues today, and I certainly don't profess to be a historian by any. Uh, measure um, and and you know after the after the Second World War, um, leaders from predominantly Western uh, leaders uh, Wilson and, and others uh, met and basically divided up the European pie, and um, um, and the Russians were also busily acquiring uh, states and uh, dividing up what they thought were their spoils. And, um, 
and so people ended up being displaced from their from their place of origin um, in, in in similar ways that indigenous people had for the previous 150 years been displaced from their places of origin. So, you know, humans on the face of the world have a, a, a long history of dominant cultures um, uh, taking over other cultures. You know, lots of people have written about that. So I, I, that's part of the history. And, you know, in, in the, when the Russians invaded Hungary and Hungarian refugees and Czech refugees tried to escape that regime, um, people were people were killed. Countries were divided up, and you know we, the, the Israeli-Palestine uh, situation today is is one of the probably the longest-standing um, outcomes of that particular dividing up of of into geopolitical territories. So, um, you know, I'm I'm not the expert here. I can only just say a little tiny bit about my own. Um, exposure, if you will. Um, okay, I, the whole concept of expert is a relative thing for me or an expert, so that's good enough for, uh, in terms of larger picture. Well. No, because we had uh, Michael Lang also. Michael Lang, his father also had to move out because of this situation. So that was, I mean, mm. a lot of people have got affected. I mean, those kind of things, with those stories and what they went through because of that. I mean, it's for a child also to see all that and then to move out into a totally different world. I mean, tough things for people to do. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. And, you know, we're, we, we're going to see increasingly mass movements of people as climate uh, change continues to impact um, uh, the world in, in ways we have yet only to imagine. Okay. But that's another that's another episode. Another episode. <laughs> <laughs> but then, how much time? Then how much time did you spend in that area? I mean, Hungary was. And... Well, we were in Europe for for a year. It was a sabbatical for my father from the university. He went there to do research. So we we traveled to to different countries. We you know we sort of did the tour of Europe thing, um, and you... and then I went back. Um, you have Saturday. to tell us about the tour. That must have been a very interesting tour. How much I remember of it did... that. Um, um, my, my mother gave my sister and I knitting needles and we knitted squares uh, in her effort to keep us um, from, from um, killing each other. But knitting needles don't seem like a very safe uh, way to keep people from... <laughs> anyway, um, it, it's, oh. my predominant memory <laughs> was little snippets of events that happened and then driving from place to place, knitting a stack of squares that never got made into anything. Um, but you have to tell us about your sister. You haven't told us about her. Uh, my sister is uh, three years younger than I am, Wendy. Um, uh, he, he, I don't know, uh, lots to tell, I suppose. We, no, we, I, mean, my, I think the starting point, the interesting part is that how does a child who's the only child at that point of time has a, a another a sister coming in or another a sibling coming in how do you take to that and how that affects you at, at all have you looked back at that i mean that, that's how it starts and we see other relationship aspect differently sure. yeah i mean it, it was it was curious to me and we, we got along for the most part and sometimes we didn't get along at all um uh my sister is is certainly the the far more uh, cognitively focused than I am. I'm the more creative, uh, curious one. My sister can quote facts and figures and and uh, people who wrote things. I'm more interested in uh, integrating information and, and playing with it and pulling it apart and being curious about it. So we, different personalities, certainly, for sure. I think I'm more like my father and my sister is more like my mother who was a very intelligent woman in her own right. Um, but also uh, as a woman, you know, had to struggle to be recognized for uh, what she brought. And, and then unfortunately for most of her adult life, she was, she was quite ill uh, she was uh, she had uh, polycystic kidney disease and um, ended up for the last uh, 15 years of her life being on kidney dialysis. Um, mm -hmm. So she, you know, went about her life um, learning things and running a home, which was what women did in those days. 
So okay, so after I mean, when they moved, she was taking care of the house. She wasn't. She didn't start working after her college. No, no, she worked for a few days, but then my father no. was moved to do a PhD at Southern Cal, and then we moved to Rochester, and so she. And by then, she had two young children, so she spent spent her time looking after us. So tell us about all the good things she taught you. All those things that you remember now, look back as good things. At that time, I'm sure you didn't think they were good things. But... Oh well, I I think you know she was very open to learning new things and and certainly encouraged us to learn. She she uh, she tried to learn German, but it was just a challenge for her. And then her two young daughters went off to a German elementary school and very quickly became fluent, uh, leaving her behind. Mm -hmm. But my mother was very good, and I think this is the trait that I did pick up from her. She was very good at connecting people, at networking, at introducing you. To, oh, you should know. You should know that person. And what about that person? And I, I know that's that's something that I I do. Um, and uh, uh, she she was a, a wonderful um, entertainer. She loved. We often had parties in our home. Um, my dad's graduate students or colleagues from around the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we had, we always had people from around the world in our, in our home. Um, I can remember my father had a, a Japanese uh, graduate student actually. And, um, and uh, they, he came with his wife and they were recently married and she still had her kimono from the marriage ceremony and so my mother encouraged her to put it on and and show everyone what a beautiful um, outfit uh, this was I remember uh, we had you know all corners of the world uh, people coming through our home and my mother was always very gracious and was curious about you know their lives and um, uh, what was important to them in the corners of the world that they came came from. Um, and I think my mother had developed those skills um, uh, through her through her own life. And as I said, she went to the United Nations as a as a teenager as a um, to participate in some some events there. So you know that that sort of way of connecting came very naturally to her. But, but but for the fact that I mean you have all that in, all these interests and everything and then you're looking after the house and she, I mean, she, was was this something that she always spoke about did she have I mean, what did she say about that Oh she loved her home she loved to be um, uh, designing how the flowers looked and what food she was cooking and uh, her favorite dessert to cook for company was a cheesecake. And so I still have that recipe and I call it Ma's cheesecake. Um, and so. But it does it taste as good? Hold on. Oh, uh, tastes better. It was hard. It was, uh, it was always hard to get. There was only a little teeny tiny sliver left over. And my sister and I had to fight over that little tiny piece. Uh, so now I make big, huge cheesecakes and I can eat as much as I want. <laughs> But the only thing is when you get, you can eat as much as you can, maybe you're not supposed to eat that much. <laughs> well, that's a story for another day, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> there are too many stories and too many days. So we have lots to fix up with you in terms of dates. Okay. So basically now you I mean, your mother is taking care of you, your sister and what kind of a neighborhood is this? I mean, where are you living? Uh, we lived about uh, three blocks from the, from the beach and uh, there were kids all around. There was a family next door and, and uh, we were very close to this family. They had um, uh, eventually three boys and a little girl and we were the big sisters of this little girl. Um, and we were always in each other's homes and uh, having dinner and, and playing together. We were rarely inside the house any time of the year. We were always building something or off on some adventure. Yeah. But this is the important part because they're playing together. Now that's just one word you said and you want to move on. But you want to know what were you playing? What were those games that you played at that time? I mean, things have changed. You know that, Kathy, that a lot of those things are not <laughs> happening now. Kids don't know about sadly, it. Sadly, sadly. I don't know. We just, we, we built things. We built forts and we, we uh, played hide and seek and um, 
Uh, we'd go to the beach and explore things, um, you know, but, and we were also, um, I don't know, just enjoyed each other's company. Um, we'd, we'd, uh, we'd wrestle, we'd have snowball fights, we'd, we'd go off skiing together. Um, we lived on a big steep hill. And so when it snowed in the winter, we could ski down the hill and oh. walk back up again. Um, good fun. Yeah, it was, it was good fun. But, but in terms of toys, what were the toys in that period? What, what toys were kids playing with? Um, I had um, Meccano set. Oh. Um, uh, I know when we when we lived in Germany, Lego was just being introduced to the world, and my father uh, bought us a Lego set uh, that still is in our family. It didn't. It wasn't you know, pre-built kinds of things like pirate ships and everything like Lego is today. It was Lego blocks. Just the and, pieces. Uh, it was just the pieces. And we could spend hours, you know, building the with the Lego when we were inside. But, you know, for the most part, we were just playing outside with sticks and whatever else we could find each other. So the whole outdoor thing was one important part. For you, that outdoor spaces and Water, water is something which you've been close to all the time. Yes. But you have something around you? I didn't care for school particularly because um, uh, I was A, locked inside in a building um, and all I could do was look out the window at the clouds going by wanting to be outside. Um, so I, I didn't excel particularly at school. Um, and my sister could uh, spin A's and top marks out of absolutely anything. And so it became a bit of a, uh, an issue in the family that there was a lot of support for my sister to pursue intellectual activities. And I was pretty much left to my own devices, but I had the freedom to run around the neighborhood and go places. And, and um, I was trusted that I could handle myself out there and my sister was trusted that she could handle herself in the classroom mm -hmm. and so those were the classic differences between us which is probably why it took me you know 70 years to finish a master's degree <laughs> <laughs> well but where is where is wendy she's i mean where she's, is in she vancouver. she's in vancouver um uh, you... she She's uh, she's a tutor actually. She she did a, a master of fine arts at, at uh, UBC and studied uh, with the Guatemalan peoples in in uh, Guatemala, um, uh, looking at um, uh, the tapestries tapestries and the weavings that they did there. Um, but um, she uh, called her professor into account over an article that he wrote that was. Um, basically plagiarized and she knew that. And as a result, she was pretty much blackballed. And I know that's a rather racist term these days, but she was blackballed from the profession. So she turned to tutoring. She's an amazing tutor. She's worked with children with all sorts of learning disabilities who would otherwise have fallen through the crack. And she supported them to graduate from university and, and uh, go on and be hugely successful. She's, she's an incredible, uh, teacher and motivator of, of learning. So uh, she eventually found her calling. <laughs> but do people get to meet often? Oh, well, not during COVID, but otherwise, oh yes, we, we always had family gatherings throughout our whole life until we, you know, unless we moved off into different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so she and her, she lives with her second husband and, and she has, uh, uh, seven grandchildren I forget I can't keep count um, her son and and her granddaughter live in Italy and her other son and his troop of children uh, and wife live in Portland Oregon but you have conversations about the time growing up I mean you have some um, not, not so much not so much um, we we to have conversations about what's going on now with our families. The past is not something we... No, but what about the friends from that period? I mean, do, do people stay in touch for that many years? I mean, do you have any anyone from that point of time? 
I have um, two friends from high school, but otherwise not not really haven't stayed in touch. I'm not. I'm not. Um, well, uh, but two's also not bad. I mean, that's not bad. If you, not if, bad. Ex, I mean, ex- imagine ex- from high school. From high school, come on. Look, that's years back. Right? It's not just high school. That's like how many years back you, you, you can imagine. So staying in touch for that many years is uh, not bad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But let me ask everyone. If anyone else wants to come in and ask her, just put, put your hand, raise your hand and let's just come in. But your virtual hand, I won't be able to see your physical hand because i don't have you on the screen right now okay okay so now you're growing up and you've played with meccano and lego inside and of course the outdoor activities but then what about but but in terms of are you have a diverse kind of people living around or is it i mean if, if, no it's very much a white world um uh w- you know, the introduction to to sort of the intercultural community was mostly through my father's colleagues, and um, and his graduate students, and and of course, uh, living living in, in Europe as a 10, 11 year old, and then uh, after um, after high school, I I went back to Europe to um, hitchhike around Europe and uh, work there uh, for about a year. So. Um, I went to university in France for a while. Well, that's and... much later. That's much later. That's much later. We have to. But what about while you're growing up? What what are holidays? Holidays like family holidays, things like that. Oh, we, went, we went back to California to see my grandparents every summer, all through high school. Um, I think you know it was important for my mother. My mother and her mother were very close, and so we would stay <clears throat> with my mother's grandparents for you know, several weeks and with my father's grandparents for several weeks every summer. That should have been a good experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But what, yeah. Kind of, what, what kind of stories were you told about? They must have, they must be taking you through their life. So what, what did you learn or hear? Well, not, not too much. Um, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't something that um, my parents had much time for (laughs) i mean my my mother's family were certainly more storytellers uh, than my father's uh family my my um uh, my paternal grandmother you know lived in the present wasn't too interested in talking about the past Um, in fact my father and his brother tried to find out about how is it they came to live in new york how is it during the during the the crash of the stock market in the 20s that they owned a car, that he and his brother went to a very elite private school, that they lived uh, right across from Central Park in in New York. Um, But try as they might, they were never able to unearth uh, how they came to be there as a family. Um, I I do know that my, my grandmother was the one who controlled the finances of the family um, she also liked to bet on the horses and was very successful. And every time we run, she won, she'd take us all out to dinner at Anthony's. Um, and, um, every time, uh, she lost, uh, we didn't see her for a couple of days. <laughs> um, but did you pick up that from her? Th- no, I, I don't bet on the horses. I don't, I don't bet on anything. Um, you bet on yourself, I'm sure. I do. I do. Good. That's good I've enough. Been, been pretty good at buying and selling houses. So. <laughs> so, but, but, but in terms of, I mean, obviously there must be, but from your maternal grandmother, grandfather, what, what, what was that? I mean, what is the history there? Oh, well, that's um, uh, also, you know, a history tied up with the history of the United States. As I said, my great grandfather was a, an immigrant from Wales. He was the black sheep of the family. There was no more room for him. So he was sent off to America to find his way in the world. He, um, uh, he was part of, um, uh, uh, anyway, my, so um, on my mother's side, my, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather was, um, uh, 
basically left on his own from age 12. He was a hobo. He rode the rails for many years. And then he, he got into plumbing. He was a, a union organizer for which he got beaten up within an inch of his life. Uh, many years ago, I went to the little town where my mother grew up to see a picture of him in the museum. Um, uh, he uh, eventually left plumbing over a deal that went sideways with the United States government and uh, became a lawyer and graduated at age 65. So I guess in some ways I'm following in his footsteps. He became a lawyer. He was invited to sit on the Supreme Court by President Kennedy and invited to his inaugural ball. Um, so very connected um, politically in his in his era as a you know president of the Plumbing Contractors Association of California, huge organization. My grandmother was the uh, equally organizer of events and and making uh, making decorations and and basically event planning. Although you didn't call it that day, it was just you know as the wife of the president, that's what you did. It was very artistic and always sending us little creative things to work on uh, growing up. But what was the kind of place they were living in? There uh, was... they in first, they lived in a, a, a house in, in San Jose. Um, and then they moved to a, another beautiful home. And then uh, my grandfather had a contract with the federal government to build a campsite in the Sierras. And he had a huge number of people <clears throat> A big team working for him and then uh, uh, halfway through the project um, the government uh, pulled the pin on it and uh, didn't pay him and so he paid out of his own pocket all of his employees um, and uh, that cost him his home um, and his way of livelihood which is the point at which he went to law school and the last time I saw him alive they were living in a little apartment in Los Angeles um, and he was studying the law and my grandmother was working in a thrift store and uh, I was uh, 18 and headed to Europe to travel around um, and he did he was he did as I said become a lawyer and and uh, I think that story was also um, in part the inspiration to me to become a mediator I, I had questions about the law, <laughs> uh, and yet it's also the story that inspired my daughter to become a lawyer. And she's a very successful lawyer practicing in Vancouver. Okay, just to jump ahead a little bit. Okay. But what about what about the other what about cousins and all those people? Where are all those people? Mm, um, my cousins are, are all still in California. Um, I've I've basically lost track of them. Um, uh, I'm in. I'm in touch with one of my cousins on Facebook. He's a photographer. He takes um, photographs of beautiful women. His mother was a beautiful woman. I woman. I guess that's what his. He's indicated that that's what inspired him. That's her on the far left in the white. Um, okay. But but while growing up, I mean, you you had these all these cousins well, we, and all. But the, well. Um, the cousins my on my mother's brother's side in um, lived in San Jose, so quite close. So we we played a lot together. Went to my grandfather's plumbing shop together and got into trouble. Um, can I just pause? Well, well, can I just interrupt? Kato is in Japan, so it's a little late for him. He wants to leave, so he just wants to say bye. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Yes, very late. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Oh, it's a pleasure to, to see you. And uh, I would like to follow it up by uh, tuning into the YouTube. But if you could excuse me, because it's uh, one o'clock in the morning. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, very nice to see you. And uh, yeah, uh, what you said was, uh, gave me a lot of uh, sort of a uh, nice feelings about your childhood. Right. Uh, I vaguely, because you know, I'm not very different. I, I'm a 66, right? So we live in the same sort of generation today. Right? Yes. And I'm sure we have a chance to talk again. You know, yes, in yes, definitely. Another, next episode, yes. That yes. time what we do is we keep it a little earlier. 
but we'll try and <laughs> convince Kathy to be to wake up a little earlier. Certainly. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, sir. Bye. Bye, Kato. So that's the look. That's the kind of passion we need. These are the people who look. I imagine one o'clock in the morning also they want to come and move. So that's I think that's the nice part about people that we, that I'm getting together. That's a nice thing. Okay. So but now we're back to that. Whatever you were, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see where was <laughs> what era was I in? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think my, my question was basically in terms of family, who were those people that you were growing up with and what do you remember about them and the kind of relationships you had with them? You know, when we were kids, we played together and we, we all got along well, we, you know, we, but, um, you know, we're, we're not, I'm not really in touch anymore other than occasionally on Facebook um, with my cousin Sandy, who's uh, the little boy. Uh, there in the picture. Um, uh, but at that time, while growing up, while growing up, I mean, when you went to your, see your grandparents, did they also come in and you had that, that kind uh, of a get together? Sometimes, but it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't on a daily basis. You know, the, the, the real, you know, people that I played with were at home in Van, in Vancouver that I would spend time with. So, you know, mostly we were there to visit my grandparents and to, and to hang out with them. We would see our cousins, um, you know, for sort of more formal get togethers. Uh, um, but um, we didn't, we didn't, we, you know, we lived in those days, it was a long drive to even to go to the next little town. And so, we, you know, we just didn't, didn't spend that much time together. But I'm quite surprised that Lisa has, doesn't have anything to ask. Normally, she has something to ask. Lisa, if you have to, I can't see you. I'm telling you, I, I can't see even if you want to ask. So you'll have to, if you want to raise your hand otherwise, or you want to say something, you can always come in now. No, I'm I'm really having a lot of fun listening to Kathy's story. It's, it's funny that we have shared so much, but then there's so much more to share. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious about, um, it, well, I would be taking you back again. So, you know, it's like, how did you get from New York to California? I still didn't figure that out. <laughs> well, I was born in California and my, do my dad was working on his PhD ultimately there. And then he had a postdoctoral fellowship. So we moved from California to Rochester, New York. Ah, okay. Now I get it. Yeah. And he was looking for a full-time position and eventually he negotiated a deal at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, so we moved to this country called Canada uh, when I was five. And what was the what the Canada then and the Canada now? Oh, you have to tell us. You can tell us what it was like then. Well, it was uh, you know it was international uh, where I grew up, but it was also white international. Um, uh, uh, it was very privileged. Um, I, I know that in in grade two in my elementary school there was one um, black girl, Charlotte, um, but I know nothing of her history. And other than being in the classroom with her, which was very structured in those days, you sat in your seat and you didn't move. Um, I didn't, I don't even recall playing with her. I know, uh, and the same is pretty much true in high school. We had, um, we had, uh, uh, two uh, twin boys from, from China who were, had immigrated from China, a young uh, girl who had sent to live with her uncle uh, from Japan, who was a grocery, uh, grocer and abused her for many, many years until she eventually committed suicide. Um, uh, you know, but the, but, the, but the multicultural mix, to use a Canadian term of, turn of phrase, was was basically from European descent, uh, from from uh, uh, white Europeans. Uh, we had one uh, young woman whose family had immigrated from India, and um, that was pretty much the extent of it. So a very uh, insulated um, upbringing from that perspective, and the same was was pretty much true at university. It was before. Um, there was 
um, I guess this second mass migration from, from China and, uh, and from, from the Philippines, it was sort of predated that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was at university. So, um, and I was, you know, involved in my own activities, um, skiing and sailing and, and trying to fit in, you know, time for university on the side. But not having grown up in a, with a very diverse kind of friends or children around you, has that had any has that made any difference as you grew up? Or did you feel? I I think that if I hadn't had the opportunity to go and live in Europe and see the impacts of of different cultures or have sent my children off around to explore the world, I think that I would have continued to live in a very insulated and insular uh, environment. But I think, you know, having been exposed to other cultures and other, you know, um, ways of, of being um, and, and being curious about those different uh, lifestyles and, and cultures has, um, enabled me to broaden my view and and also in stark contrast after I went away and and lived elsewhere coming back and in contrast to my friends who hadn't had this experience and wondering often about their very narrow view of the world um, you know all through all through uh, school and and it, all through university uh, as as well just um, and then I I moved you know, jumping ahead again, I moved to, to the interior of British Columbia to build a house. And I kept going into the local town and I kept thinking, there's something weird here, but I can't quite figure it out. It took me about three or four months to figure out that there, there were no people of color in the community. When I went into town, the people on the streets were all white. Um, and only occasionally did I see a member of a First Nation community, and often that was somebody who was in distress. Um, and and uh, so, yeah, so anyway, here I am. Where That's would you like, like to go now? <laughs> you, you've also lived in uh, New Mexico, right? So we have a lot more places to discover. Yeah. I haven't I haven't lived in New Mexico, but my grandmother was born in New Mexico. My mother was born in Arizona. And I for many years, I went there every summer for a, a month to explore. And um, here comes the cat uh, to explore and learn about my mother's history that I only grew up hearing about as an adult. My mother didn't want to go back. And so we never went back to Arizona or New Mexico as, as a child. Mm-hmm. But right now, but, but, but this place that you're living in, that you're living in, what, what kind of a place is that? I mean, again, I like, I'm just asking from the diversity point of view. Just... Sure. Falkland is a very conservative, a white um, uh, mining town, uh, <clears throat> about 500 kilometers um, north and a bit east of Vancouver on the coast. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Last year, the local little grocery store was bought out by um, a couple of young Sikhs. And so that threw the community into a tailspin. There were numerous racist remarks on Facebook. Um, And uh, earlier this year, the uh, local uh, First Nations um, had a permit to conduct uh, ceremonial activities on a local lake and uh, the white hunting community was all up in arms. Uh, you can't let these people go in and, and hunt on hunt on our land. Uh, just revealing the limited knowledge of the real history of Canada and the, the stolen lands uh, that we live on. So that's where I live. And, oh, and I'm lesbian, so, you know, <laughs> that doesn't help either. No, but I'm just thinking 300 people and already we're talking about conflict. So many conflicts there. So how many mediators do we need per what? How many population? For every 100, do we need one or do for every, how does it work? For every two people, you need a third mediator. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So because I really because I hear I keep saying that in terms of numbers, how many mediators do we need in the world? In this way, I think <laughs> that's like huge numbers. Yes. Oh. Yes. 
but but okay so now i mean okay but which at this point school is what is the school is done now is it i mean there must be more interesting things happening in school oh for me now you mean i know that time that time when anyway, we we have oh. to go back there we have to go back there now uh-huh. we can't let you go run come here um, at the, um, yeah i did a degree in in physical education but that's much later that's much later no i mean but oh. what, what what about school a school i mean what what are the what are kids doing i mean as school as a school trip you're going out somewhere the activities outside are they all the all those kind of things happening in school i suppose um i was more interested in doing things out of school so um you know and i i was involved in sports in school i i played all the different sports and was in track and field and um all of those kinds of things but um school was not particularly interesting to me i mean i managed to do well enough to get into university <clears throat> so basically the teaching methodology was not something that you would maybe agree upon the way sorry i didn't quite hear the question the, the teaching methodology there in school it was not something that worked for you no it did not <laughs> um, actually eventually i went to work for the learning disabilities association where i spent my time trying to say teach parents and and teachers the idea that um yes for some children there were neuro uh, neurological challenges but for the most part children that got labeled as learning disabled weren't learning disabled at all it was the teachers who were disabled yeah. who didn't have the expertise to be able to understand how that particular individual learned exactly i think that's where i mean of course Elisa and I have these discussions about training people. I sometimes feel that that training might go against you. You have a natural ability, and someone else is trying to put you into another box because that person only understands that box. So sometimes training can go against you, also. Yes, I think, and and for for me, I think there were a few things like that that went against me. I didn't learn in the normal way. Um, I think if I were in school as a as a child now, I probably would have been labeled as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and learning disabled and all sorts of other things. But clearly, I'm not. Um, exactly. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm curious. I'm creative. I'm imaginative. Um, I definitely lean towards thinking outside the box and recognize when I am thinking inside the box. Um, mm. Yeah, that's the thing. I think that natural ability you should. I mean, the other person might not even understand, and for that person who doesn't understand, to put you through whatever, the beat training or guidance or whatever you might call it. How does it person do it? They don't even do understand what kind of a mindset you have and the kind of thought process that you have. So it's a very. I mean, it's a very sensitive kind of way because you take changing someone's direction of life, maybe. Mm, yes. Yes. Well, and I think, particularly in the in the Western world, and in my experience, the focus on education is from here up, or maybe even from here up, because sometimes we don't even want to hear you speak. Thank you very much, um, and and that's a real a real loss. And I think that's why I was drawn into into the physical world. I learned through expressing things in my body as a kinesthetic learner. you know and and i think in education in in teaching of education we still focus on the cognitive skills we don't focus on on the the kinesthetic or the or even the visual necessarily or 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 the auditory is given predominance well i really find find interesting that there's a person called temple garden she i think she was Okay, autistic is what they used to call her. Because that time, I think when she was growing up, I, I, the whole terminology was definitely different, and how they were labeled was different. They didn't even maybe they didn't even have a name for it. But how interesting how she talks about her learning and everything. I think that was quite interesting. Mm. Actually, yes, one of my favorite books was Howard Gardner's uh, Frames of Mind, where he talks about all the different ways in which. Um, people learn yeah and express mm. themselves yeah. yeah exactly but that too why this training thing comes up is because i what the kind of the way i'm looking at promoting mediation and the whole concept of mediators is that the idea is that there are people who have the natural ability they they have the mediator mindset and the whole idea is to identify them and 
take them into the process as they go along and they do their mediations instead of thinking that we'll train them in a certain manner and we make mediators which according to me doesn't happen and this whole idea why why we doing this show is because i mean the people like you who are there as and i going to be have that natural ability and whatever your background and everything what the reasons are and why you are what you are we'll of course get go through but i think there is lots more in terms of being a mediator lots more it's not that every some people think 40 hour training and now you're a mediator yes so. you know that was one of the things that struck me when i finally went to the justice institute which was a new uh organization of higher learning in vancouver and there were a lot of lawyers that were taking the taking the mediation training this was in the late 90s i guess and you know what struck me was they were now having to face you can't do that right now um they were now having to sort of learn a different way of working with people they were brought to be they were trained to be adversarial to fight somebody else's battle and in mediation we're trained to help those two parties to to work out um where their common ground is and to to settle their own their own problems and i i see this as probably the biggest failing of mediation organizations right now is that we're moving back we're moving from mediation to arbitration because law this is my personal opinion because it uh, lawyers feel like they're losing control of their of their client base um oh. and um but we want we want allow you to have these discussions and this is a, this is your story this is today is your story we'll do that like, no, but this is part of my story you know having later, been a mediator and and seen that and and been a part of many sort of early mediation organizations and watching the conflict in the organizations i stood up at a breakfast meeting er, early in my mediation days and said um to leaders of two different mediation organizations it sounds like you need to hire a mediator and i'm available <laughs> and there was there wasn't even laughter there was just utter silence in the room it's like okay i think i'll be going now <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so but we will we'll come to we'll get there we'll get there but right now we still have to get you to this point we're far away from this point right now so so, so so basically now high school is done and you've got i mean after that what straight into college is it Or... uh well i went i did one year at university and then i went uh, to live in in europe with a friend uh, that i'm still friends with um we hitchhiked around europe we went to work in a swiss boarding school which was another horrendous experience my father came and rescued both of us because he was doing a sabbatical in bologna in italy at the time um so but that but that trip you have to take us through that trip would have been an interesting trip what you learned on that trip that you went around europe i think i have to take us through that slowly <laughs> what countries what experiences all that take, i'll take you through it quickly no, why have, why we I, could i have to go i have an yeah we'll do another episode we we'll do another yeah. episode you get but everything that you do take us slowly through that don't mm-hmm. don't rush us we like to we like to get totally into you your life at that point of time you we were i like to imagine what you were doing at that time mm-hmm. i was sticking out my thumb and getting rides with interesting truck drivers uh, for the most part i was lucky i had a few close calls but um, yeah that's a story we have to hear exactly sure. that's what i'm saying that's we want to hear this <laughs> wherever you want to start where whichever part of europe that you started from it been yeah. it been interesting it was an interesting trip no so now you you want to take us now or you would now you need to take a break now so i do i do need to go um okay. it's a delight i would love to you know have more of a dialogue with with you vikram with lisa with you rosalia where are you in canada vancouver no no uh, montreal montreal she's in montreal montreal, montreal. you did montreal. you did say and and you work for, and you work for the federal government yes i do I oh do. very good in which which ministry I work for uh, Employment and Social Development Canada, uh, but I uh, work on in- Indigenous um, files. I also worked for INAC for a while. Okay. Um, with respect to the residential schools. <laughs> you work with Did you work with Marie Wilson then on the on the TRC? Yep. Okay. A little bit a little bit. <clears throat> so right now that's a hot subject uh, as no you kidding. know. 
Uh, I, I've been getting backlash I'll even, as far as, well, not that far, but from the U.S. Like I have good friends. I, I worked at the U.N. and I have friends from the U.N. that actually called me yesterday and they were really upset with what's uh, coming out. But I'm not surprised, as you probably no. know, and no. there's probably more that's going to come out. Uh, oh, you know, oh, ab absolutely. A lot there. more. I mean, uh, please, please educate us. What is it all about? This is like... Give us a basic it's idea. A, it's about basic coming idea. to terms with our colonial history, I think, is partly what it's about. That's exactly it. It's, it's sad. It's a very, very sad part of our history. Unfortunately, um, it, it, it dates back to 100 years. Basically, the Catholic Church, but not only the Catholic Church, was also the Protestant Church, if, if I remember correctly. Uh, Christian Christian denomination, uh, let's say, faith, uh, yeah. had residential schools where, you know, they would go and um, basically take the children from uh, reserves, from uh, the First Nations, from indigenous populations, from coast to coast, huh? from Vancouver all the way to... Um, happened in the U.S. too. And in the, oh, US. the U.S. too. See, I didn't know about and the And in US. the U.S., all okay. over. I didn't know you about You just may be ahead of us in dealing with it right now. A little well, bit, but the U.S. is following recent with the recent announcement in the U U.S. To, mm -hmm. to investigate that and the number of, of schools that were set up to take that Indian out of the Indian, to be quite blunt. Those were exactly that was, that was the purpose. To That's assimilate. exactly uh, to assimilate, uh, you know, they strip them of their culture, their language, and they were land. Uh, their land, land, of course. Their land is the first. <laughs> Yeah. Basically, yeah. Canada is indigenous land from yes. coast to coast. Oh, so is the United States. They've just done a better job of obliterating. Exactly. Uh, well, it we had the Trail of Tears that uh, where where they just moved people um, out into some other land, and and many of them died on the way. And uh, you know, I I don't know. There was a rumor, and I don't think you know my my DNA doesn't bear it out, but there was a rumor that there was indigenous um, elements in my family. And um, my, my great aunt said so, and then she said they weren't allowed to talk about it. So like it even got buried. If you had anything in it, any part of Native American in your family, it got buried. A lot of history, a lot of history. Arrived. A lot of healing that has to take place now. A lot of healing. And I think this is where Canada as a government has really gone wrong in that we have to do the healing before there can be any talk of reconciliation. Reconciliation, mm -hmm. as we know as mediators, can only happen between two equal parties. And we don't have that. Um, and uh, there is a lot of work uh, to do. So, Kathy, so, when do you want to do this next? When do you want to do the next episode? Now we have... Well, um, I could I could maybe do it in August at some point or look, into the look, fall. Look, the option in August is only the 28th of August. Then otherwise, it's the 11th of September. Um, go for the 28th. I'll try that. Yeah. Okay. So could you tell me how to pronounce your name? Because I don't want to mispronounce it. My, oh, name? my name? Yes, your name, Rosalia. Ros Rosalia. She's Rosalia. Rosalia. It's an Italian name. It's Ros Rosalia. It's... Uh... My mother is from um, originally from Sicily, so oh. Rosalia is a very Sicilian name. Uh, the saint, the patron saint of of Palermo, is Santa Rosalia. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was yeah. named after my grandmother. <laughs> well, I love Not it when you pronounce it with your with your true Italian accent. Yeah, it sounds much better. Yeah, Rosalia. But what I usually, usually what I say because everybody has difficulty pronouncing it, whether you French Canadian or English. Uh, speaking they call me rosalia so what i say in french is i say rosalie or in english i say just say rosalie it's fine it's you know but it's rosalia basically i will try to do rosalia <laughs> there you got it <laughs> i speak about this much italian <laughs> it's, it's more than enough <laughs> enough to order a glass of wine and something for dinner <laughs> oh yes a nice candy <laughs> <laughs> So but now, Kathy, what's going to happen is 28th, you'll have to do it a little earlier, I think. A little earlier is better? Sure, I can, I can do that. Yep. 
I, yeah, I'm, well. you know, the sun gets up around 530. Yeah. Um, so I could, I could do six o'clock. Um, what, what whatever I mean, my time for sure. Yeah, but, I mean, whatever time you're, you're, I mean, you're up and about and you've had your coffee and everything, all that. I mean, we won't rush you into that. But I'm just saying it becomes a little easier for people like Kato. But for otherwise, for him, it becomes sure, really I, late. Yeah. If, uh, yeah. So whatever time is suits you, I mean, you can let me know. Whatever the uh, you have to be comfortable also. We don't want to yeah. get you out of bed straight onto the show. <laughs> so <laughs> so 20, 28th is okay. 28th is done. Whatever time you think is all right. But also on this on this aspect of the mediation in our culture, whatever names you people you can come up with, please just message that yes, to me. Yes, I, I put two in the chat. Um, yeah, yeah, um, certainly, I, got those. I don't know, uh, Rosalia, if you know uh, Ian Mosby at the Yellowhead Institute um, and Hayden, Hayden King, um, they are doing wonderful work and I encourage you to reach out to them. Uh, and um, uh, it's the yellowheadinstitute.org. Um, okay. if, if you look for that online, uh, they just put out a recent, uh, uh, what they call red papers, <laughs> they write red papers okay. um, on, the, on the Canadian budget and the lack of action on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I think in your role, you would find the work very insightful. Okay, I'll, I'll check it out. Definitely. And thank okay. you. Thank you. Well, lovely to meet you all. Um, uh, thank, thank you very you much for this this fun journey into my past that I can't remember much of. But anyway, <laughs> we'll take it all out. We'll take it all out slowly, slowly. We'll take everything out. But oh, the only thing it's is, so fun. But only thing is, Kathy, you'll have to be uh, whatever other pictures you can find because there's a whole gap in between. Yeah, I I don't know where they are. I think they've. Oh, sometimes the interesting thing happens is that you see the fashion of the time. What were the kids wearing at that time? Anything. It's, it's nice to see old photographs. <laughs> Should they exist, I'll see what I can find. Perfect. So, so now finally on the 28th, what, what time are you doing? Whatever time you're comfortable with. I'm not going to push uh, you on that. But 7 a.m. Pacific 7 Daylight Time. Perfect. 7 a.m. PDT. Yes. Perfect. Good. So th okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming in. Thanks. Great time. To see you, Lisa. Nice to meet you, Ro Rosalia. Vikram, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Bye. Bye, Kathy. Bye. See you soon. Bye. See you soon. Very soon. Bye.